Hi, I'm Pat Ryan. Welcome to Chicago Founder Stories here at 1871, Chicago's new digital startup hub. We have a special guest tonight, uh, John Aiello, the co-founder of Savo. Uh, I, in the interest of full disclosure, I have to tell you, I think John's advice is so great that I have him on the board of not one but two of the companies we started. So, um, well, well, I don't have any ownership in Savo. I wish I did. And uh, this, is, this is really great. It shows you... Um, John's a great director, a great entrepreneur, and, and, and a great you, friend Pat. of entrepreneurs in Chicago here. So we're really Thank glad you. to have you. Thank you very much. Um, so just to start off, for the people who don't know Savo, what, is, what does Savo do? Savo's in the business of making salespeople more effective, I mean, at the very simplest level. Um, if you think of ever selling anything in your life, which hopefully all those entrepreneurs out there are thinking exclusively about selling stuff with their <laughs> whole life, um, you need a lot of stuff. You need a lot of information. You need access to content, to people, to insight, to best practices. Savo's in the business. It's a SaaS company. Um, through and through, we have north of a million users of our software now globally across probably 300 customers, major corporations and their sales organizations. I like to describe it from the life of a salesperson who's preparing for a meeting, who's trying to find the right PowerPoint, the right uh, case study, the right subject matter expert in their organization, maybe halfway around the world. How do you push that information to these people when they need it most in the context of a selling opportunity? That's what Savo does. And, and we call it sales enablement. At the end of the day, it's making salespeople smarter so they don't have to spend a lot of time doing wasted energy type stuff of finding information and they can focus on the interaction of selling, which is where the magic happens. That's exciting. So for the uninitiated, how would it be different than what the way someone might use a salesforce.com? I would say it's very complementary to salesforce.com or the CRM category in general. If you think about it, CRM is a very critical part of an organization. It tends to have value for the management organization. I mean, we use CRM, we use salesforce.com at Savo, and we use it religiously and well. But it's really a tool for salespeople to communicate up the ladder of what's going on in their territory, what's going on in their pipeline, ultimately used in, in, in most cases for forecasting and projecting. We flip-flop it. The value of Savo is quite the converse. It's all about the salesperson. How do you make that sales individual, he or she, more effective in what they do so the pipeline they're forecasting through CRM is actually going to happen? Okay? And, and by the way, fully integrated into all CRM so that if you're in an opportunity record inside of salesforce.com, and you're saying, I need to call Bob Smith today because I'm at stage two in my sales cycle, Savo will automatically push you all the right stuff that you need for that conversation. Major time savings for salespeople, and you get to replicate what your very best people do in some of your newer people as well. That's exciting. That makes a big difference. It's very powerful. Salespeople love it. And that's usually a difference between CRM, quite honestly, Pat. They love to use Savo. Oh, yeah. CR, CRM, most implementations of Salesforce are, we won't pay you unless it's in there. Well, and that's, that's always, there. I, I'm a big believer in the stick and the carrot. <laughs> now, it's, it's interesting, um, you know, looking at what Savo does, and, uh, you know, we, one of the things we talk about in entrepreneurship, and Mark Andreessen is a big proponent of, is, you know, startups <clears throat> think so much about product, which is important, but go to market and, uh, um, you know, getting sales. We were on a board call today, and, and John said, I think only, to the CEO of the company, he said, I think only 95% of your focus has to be on sales right now. <laughs> um, you could do everything else in the other 5% of time because there are times when you're in a startup, you really have to focus. You have to get that market traction. And I think in our, well, product is so critical, you have to have the right product to sell. Um, making salespeople effective, boy, for all of us, it's like engineers. And a, a, a salesperson who's really good is 5x what an average one Absolutely. is. Absolutely. And you guys obviously make that raise the bar for everybody. Um, it's a cool idea. You're having a big impact, but where does an idea like that come from? You, you guys coined, I believe, coined the term sales enablement technology. We, we did. We, we actually didn't coin that until we were in business for about six years, so uh, we were slow on the coining of terms. Um, honestly, it started in, in the trenches. I, I was uh, a young marketer coming out of Kellogg, which is where I first met Pat, uh, plug for the, the folks up north here, um, and went to the Miller Brewing Company. Um, and was one of the brand managers for Miller Lite. And I had a great mentor up there, a guy named Mike Johnson, who said, Aiello, marketing is really, really critical, but if you don't help salespeople sell stuff, you stink. <laughs> Actually, he used different language, but for the purpose of tonight, I'll, I'll say that. So he said, your first job as a marketer is to not be here for the next 90 days. Go build some credibility in the field. Go understand how programs get localized and actually how we move boxes. This was a brilliant marketer, in my opinion, ahead of his time. And this was a guy that was a mentor for me. So I learned very early to really understand the sales world, to, to respect the differences between sales and marketing, but to understand as a marketer just walking around you know, corporate with your beautiful shiny ad or the new Miller Lite can, which by the way was really cool, um, isn't going to get the job done. It's right. how did we get the Memorial Day display? How did we sell more boxes through Safeway? How did we get distribution in the major chains? That type of stuff. So that's where it started. And what I realized was 
we kind of stunk at it, Pat. <laughs> it was pretty brutal. I, I'd see salespeople out there creating presentation decks for their big meetings at the big chain stores, and it had like a logo from like five years ago. Um, it had stuff that we didn't do anymore. Quite honestly, the brand of Miller Lite, while I called myself a brand manager, was everything but in my control. And so I said, something's got to change on that. When I left Miller, I went to run marketing and sales for a large home builder, publicly traded home builder in Chicagoland. And actually had both marketing and sales reporting up to me in that role. And I learned again how critical it was to make sure that sales and marketing were intertwined and closely knit. Um, Sabo was born out of a frustration that I had. It was a frustration as a marketer that we spend an incredible amount of money creating stuff, content, brochures. Today it's digital stuff. We spend all this money, energy, time, mind share creating stuff. And then we throw it over the transom to sales and, and kind of, come on, use it. I hope it works. You know, occasionally we'll call a sales guy, the best guy, hey, what'd you use? Hey, that was good. There's no empirical data about what actually works. So that was the frustration from the, the, the marketing side. Plus, salespeople tended to think we were a bunch of head in the clouds, let's go do another off-site type marketing folks. Um, from the sales side, I was frustrated because marketing people didn't use the language that I used. They didn't understand our sales process. Okay, they didn't understand exactly what I needed at the right time. They were creating things that, that felt good in, in corporate. So that was the frustration. And I said, you know what, there's a problem to be solved here. But I think the first lesson in terms of how, or first thought in terms of how I started Sabo was we didn't have it all figured out. We didn't start this as a, as a SaaS company. Um, we started as a consulting company. Um, I was fortunate enough and blessed, and hopefully you all will be as blessed as I was, to find a co-founder, the likes of Drew Larson, who some of uh, my Sabo gang over here knows very well. Brilliant man, brilliant technologist, who, by the way, doesn't like technology. He likes applying it. And I said, Drew, I got a really big problem that I think we can solve. He said, I think we can try and learn how to solve it. And together, we did consulting for the first two and a half years at Sabo exclusively. And we went and learned the problem in the trenches. We were, we were fortunate to be here in Chicago. Our first client uh, was Citicorp Diners Club, then the Northern Trust, then LaSalle Bank. And I'll tell you, after we'd landed Citicorp Diners Club, I said, we've got a financial services practice. Um, we didn't even have a brochure ourselves, but I certainly sold that very hard into some of these other organizations. And we learned about this problem from our customers. And eventually we said to ourselves, when the same type of organization asks us for something twice in one month, we're going to try and build a product. And we built a product in 2002. So we were SaaS before SaaS was cool. I think it was like us and Salesforce.com. I'm pretty sure it was pretty so, much it. So talk a little bit about uh, that first client. How'd you get the first consulting client? And then we could talk a little bit about sure. the first technology client, the first SaaS client. Well, first of all, I looked really sad and hungry um, and told them how much I really needed revenue. Um, revenue, by the way, is the only thing I'll ever talk to entrepreneurs about. If, if you have revenue, don't worry about your board and your governance. Actually sell something. Now you're an entrepreneur. Um, my belief is that first customer, you have to do anything you can anything you can. I was fortunate to have a, a, a network of my Kellogg classmates. Obviously, here's one of the most accomplished. But some of my classmates had moved on into some pretty senior ranks, um, sent out a note and said, hey, listen, I just started something. Here's kind of what we're going to try and do. Would you give me a few minutes to sort of investigate what you're looking for? And I think I was a pretty natural sales guy, sort of a marketer by training, sales guy by DNA. And I understood the concept of discovery and trying to probe for unmet needs and pain. And we found out that there was a, a major pain at, at Citicorp Diners Club at the time, which was they were hemorrhaging existing clients. They needed to sort of create a retention program to maintain these folks. And their account execs were out trying to do PowerPoint presentations, and it was taking them two months to even put a presentation together. It was an incredible waste of time. And of course, as any good entrepreneur does, I said, well, what if, what if we recreated your content for you? And then what if we built a technology that could automate that whole thing? And of course, the what-if question led to a absolutely, and then Drew kicked me under the table and said, you idiot, I don't know how we're going to do that. And, and what do you know? We, we started a, a little company off of, of, of an unmet need. We built a one-off technology, sat actually in our office on a server, that with one click of a button pulled data from 10 different sources and created an automated PowerPoint presentation in seconds that allowed these account managers not to focus their time on a presentation, but focus it on their customer, which is really where the magic happened. And, and then it was interesting because that need was something that I lived um, and something that every customer we would go talk to. And still to this day, I guarantee you the Sabo sales organization, which is infinitely larger than anything I ever knew before, um, every meeting, that type of need will resonate with people. So it was just a real need. We were, we were ambitious. We were hungry. Uh, frankly, we'd do anything we could do to get a, a, a break. I, I will tell you, I was very fortunate to sell my first deal to a friend. I remember handing over my proposal with shaking hands. 
thinking, are they going to say yes to this thing? And, and she looked at me and says, I, I think you might be missing a zero on that. <laughs> I was like, yes, you're right. I, I am missing it. So, it, it, you know, sell them to friends, <laughs> making them look good. Um, and, and by the way, that first project was so incredibly unprofitable, I can't even begin to think about it. And I would recommend that to everybody, way over delivered, because you know what? I had a logo on our, on our slide deck now, and, and that was a referenceable client from and day you one. you probably learned a ton. Oh, yeah, an, an enormous amount. And it was real-world learning. It wasn't whiteboard, it wasn't boardroom. It was just out there in the trenches learning. 